Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Um, it's wonderful to be reading in this room where I have spent so much money. Um, at least I'll get a little bit of that back. So, Reputations is a novel I published originally in Spanish in 2013. Um, it's probably the first thing you have to know that's, is that it is a very different book from my other novels. Um, in two senses mainly. One of them is the size, the size of the book. And I think this is important because I very, um, very willingly planned this as a short novel. This is for me a genre that does particular things. Um, I believe uh, literature is like a sort of ecosystem, or rather it follows the rules of evolution. And if a literary genre stops doing something very well, if it stops being unique in a sense, it disappears. This is what happened with um, the epic, for instance. Novels started doing what the epic did only better. And this is probably with wh why nobody writes the Iliad anymore. Um, so I think short novels, novels around 50,000 words more or less, do things in a special way. They, in a way, they, they, they have the, the subtlety of a short story and the ability to go deep into a character's destiny and, and, and the study of um, a character that longer works have. So this is what I try to do with this, with reputations. The study of one man's doom. This man is Javier Mayarino. He is a, um, a cartoonist, a political cartoonist, in a country such as Colombia where this actually matters, where political cartoonists are influential, they, they are heard, they are respected, they are feared. Um, my initial interest in the novel came from another, a, a real political cartoonist, Ricardo Rendon, who lived in Colombia in the 20s and 30s. He was an extremely influential journalist. He was respected and feared, and he was able to shape the political uh, conscience and the political the political conscience of the country and the political um, life of um, a politician. I grew up with his books. His books were lying around the house when I was growing up, and I read them without understanding a single word of um, Colombian politics in the 20s and 30s when I was 15 years old, maybe even younger. Um, and this is, this is the initial throb, as Nabokov used to say, the initial uh, uh, the, the, the very first idea or emotion that came into my mind about the novel. Um, this is the reason the character in the novel is a political cartoonist instead of a political columnist, which I was for seven years. I still write political columns. Uh, so it would, be, it would have been much easier to give uh, the, the the character, this, this job. Um, it turned out my obsession with this trade, with the trade of uh, people who are able to shape a political world through drawings, through cartoons, was more, uh, much more interesting to me. So um, I'm going to read from a passage in the novel in which Mayarino has just found out that he actually matters. He has um, he struggled for a while trying to uh, become influential, trying to uh, respect his idea of his art or of his discipline. And then at some point he realizes um, there's this feeling of public importance that he has, um, but that only gets him into trouble. He starts fighting with people, relatives greet him less warmly, friends stop inviting him to dinner, and then he asks himself, for what? That's when he received, in a single prodigious day, the answer to all his questions. 
He'd acquired the habit of walking around downtown in the afternoons, buying his daughter absurd stickers for an absurd album Magdalena, his wife, insisted she fill up, or getting his shoes shined and talking politics with the bootblacks, or simply watching life with a sort of hunger that demanded he stay out on the streets instead of returning to his morning seclusion, take off his jacket and feel his arms brush up, brush up against other arms and pick up the smell of living bodies, of the food they eat and the piss they leave in corners. That afternoon was a Tuesday, which was the day of the week Mayarino would go to the Avianca building to collect his mail from his mailbox, the metallic, gray, deep little box that brought him boundless pleasure like a magician's hat does a child. And later, sits in some nearby cafe to read his magazines and answer his letters. He arrived at 7th Avenue by the National Library, and from there, along the eastern sidewalk, began to walk south, sometimes noticing the noisy, disorderly, relentless city, sometimes so distracted that the building came into view almost unexpectedly, its long straight lines penetrating the sky and struck on a sunny afternoon by a dense light that seemed not of this world. As he went in, his hand would already be feeling for his keychain in his pocket and separating out the mailbox key so he wouldn't have to search for it in front of the cemetery wall of post boxes. And that's how it had gone that time. Mayarino made his way through the corridors through their whitish light which drew circles around everyone's eyes and turned to the little gray door. He stretched out his arm and his precise hand, that hand that could draw exact 90 degree angles without any instruments, and placed the tip of the key into the lock the way a medieval knight would have put the tip of his lance against his rival's chest. But the key did not go in. He thought at first that he'd gone the wrong, to the wrong box. He leaned down toward the little door and looked at the number on the metal tag with all its digits, the same as ever, the ones Mayarino knew by heart. He hadn't gotten it wrong. The revelation arrived late, like a careless guest. There was a shadow or texture that made him look more closely at the metallic surface, and only when he was inches away from the lock did he realize it had been blocked up with chewing gum. It was a hardened paste, it must have been there several days, that filled the slot without overflowing the edges, a conscientious piece of work. Mayarino touched the paste with the tip of the key, probed, pushed, scratched a little. Tried a carving movement with his wrist, but got nowhere. The dried gum paste remained firm. Hey, what a nasty trick to play on someone said a voice, and Mayarino turned his head to find a gold tooth glinting in the middle of, the, of an unshaven face. No way to fix that, huh? People have no respect these days. And Mayarino soon found himself climbing a muddled stairway, walking till he reached a counter, handing over his ID and watching as a petite woman went through books opened drawers and closed them again, produced a photocopy of a form from somewhere and asked if Mayarino would be paying in cash or by check, turned a deaf ear when Mayarino protested and said he hadn't lost the key, that someone had put chewing gum in the lock and the woman told him it was all the same to her. And how was he paying, cash or check? Then there were stamps in purple ink, carbon paper and pastel colored receipts time wasted in a hard and hostile plastic chair, and finally a shout ringing against the concrete walls. Mayarino? Javier Mayarino? A skinny, grief-stricken locksmith, his overalls smelling of improperly dried clothes, went back with him to face the rebellious mailbox, took a series of unnameable tools from his leather belts, the metals giving off sparks under the neon lights. 
and what followed was the violation of the lock, or what Mayarino perceived as a violation, a violent and treacherous penetration of his private life, in spite of the fact that he'd given the authorization and consent, in spite of his being present during the whole process. He felt something like physical pain at the breaking of the lock, at the snap of the little door. He was saddened by the vulnerability of his collection of magazines, looking at him imploringly from the shadowy depths, the latest Alternativa, the latest New Yorker, a back issue of Le Canard Enchaîné a Parisian colleague had sent him. He wanted to leave and be home already, in his refuge, reading with a glass of beer, hearing or sensing the reassuring presence of his wife and daughter. But he still had to witness the installation of the new lock and get the new keys and sign more papers and put tips in faceless hands before going back out onto 7th Avenue, carrying his leather bags long across his chest, the back of his neck sweaty, his eyes tired for, from so much darkness. Later, he would think it had all begun with that tiredness or the disorientation that always overwhelmed him after contending with the senseless bureaucracy of this country, or simply the white color of the envelope, that immaculate white with no address, no writing of any kind, no stamps, no blue and red stripes that revealed a letter's having arrived from abroad. He'd started taking the magazines out of his bag, impatient to begin leafing through them, and had his hand stuck inside it, fingers moving as if through a card catalog, head looking down to see the covers, when he noticed the corners sticking out between the pages. He stopped in the middle of the square, looked at the front and back of the envelope, then opened it. Javier Mayarino read the typed text of the letter with neither date nor address. With your warping of the truth, you have assaulted and discredited the armed forces of our republic, playing into the hands of the enemy. You are an unpatriotic liar, and we hereby notify you that the patience of those who are loyal to our beloved country is wearing thin. We know where you live and where your daughter goes to school. We will not hesitate to punish with the harshest severity any further infringements against our honor. On the last line, over to the right, with no regards, no sincerely, no yours faithfully, a single word that seemed to be shouting from the page, patriots. The first thing he did when he got home was to show Magdalena the letter. And he knew she was genuinely worried when she started making fun of the wording and the grammar. Between the two of them, they tried to remember the last cartoon he'd drawn on a military subject. They had to go back several weeks to a series of three drawings in which a disconsolate horse was talking to a woman who was handling some iron structures. Mayarino had drawn those scenes after Felisa Burstin, a Bogotá sculptor famous for working with scrap iron, had been accused of subversive activities imprisoned in the army's stables, manhandled and humiliated, and later forced into exile. Magdalena and Mayarino propped the originals up on the long living room sofa and spent a good while looking at them as if wishing they could vanish from the recent past. That night they were so frightened that they dragged a mattress into their bedroom so Beatriz, who had just turned six, could go to bed there, and the family slept like that, heaped up in the insufficient space, breathing stale air all night with their pressed wood door securely locked. Days of paranoia would follow. Mayarino looking over his shoulder on the city streets and returning home before dark. But later, when the memory of the threat began to fade away, what they'd remember would be the reaction of Rodrigo Valencia, the director of the paper, who'd burst out laughing on the other end of the phone line when Magdalena called him at the newspaper the day after Mayarino received the note to tell him what had happened. 
Mayarino watched Magdalena furrow her brow. The telephones talked to her ear, then heard her faithfully relay the message. Rodrigo says, congratulations, you finally made it. He says, you're nobody in this country until somebody wants to hurt you. Thank you very much. So that passage in the novel was a kind of flashback, uh, a kind of um, <coughs> exploration of Mayarino's past life. <coughs> but the novel is set in the present, uh, just after Mayarino, who is 65 now, is receiving this kind of homage for his life's work, for having become a sort of moral conscience of the country. Um, after the, the end of the homage, he gets this visit of, uh, from a young woman who gets into his house pretending to be a reporter, pretending to be interested in an interview with him. And then she tells him uh, she was just lying. She tells him she just wanted to see the inside of Mayarino's house because she had already been there. 28 years before, she visited that house as a small friend of Beatriz, uh, Mayarino's daughter, and something happened to her in that night, during that night, 28 years before. And now she's here to ask Mayarino to remember, to try to remember and to try to figure out what really happened to her, what really happened in that night 20 years, years before. And so the second section of the novel begins. There are women who do not preserve on the map of their face any trace of the little girl they once were. Perhaps because they've made great efforts to leave childhood behind, its humiliations, its subtle persecutions, the experience of constant disappointments. Perhaps because something's happened in the meantime, one of those private cataclysms that don't mold a person but rather raise them like a building and force them to reconstruct themselves from scratch. Mayarino looked at Samantha Leal, and hunted in her features for some shape. The curve of the frontal bone where it reaches the space between the eyebrows, the way the earlobe joins the head. Or perhaps an expression he'd seen on the face of the child 28 years ago. And he could not. That child had gone as if she'd refused to go on living in that face. Although it was true, on the other hand, that he'd seen her only once and over the space of a very few hours. And perhaps his memory, which had always allowed him to recall the essential features of any face with a surgeon's precision, was now starting to deteriorate. If that were the case, the deterioration could not be less opportune. For now, Samantha Leal, from whose face a little girl had vanished, was urgently asking him to remember that little girl and her visit to this house in the mountains in July of 1982. And not just that, but also the circumstances of that long ago visit, the names and distinguishing marks of those present that afternoon, everything Mayarino saw and heard, but also, if possible, what the rest of them saw and heard. Remember, please, Samantha Leal said to him. I need you to jog your memory. And he thought of that curious turn of phrase, to jog a memory, as if memory were something we could take out an exercise or nudge into action by way of certain well-chosen materials, by the mere effort of physical work. Memory would be then one of those horrible fountains sold by the roadside from the quarries and the hills and that anyone could bring to life if they had talent and tools and obstinacy. Mayarino knew it was not like that. And yet here he was now trying to extract the sculpture from the stone, 
standing in front of a woman awaiting an answer beside the now darkened window. The whole house and the mountains leaned over the glowing city as if spying on it. Mayarino saw the luminous stitches against the black background, the city converted into a backlit, embroidered piece of fabric. And in the distance, floating in the night air, planes waiting their turn to land. And he thought about the men and women who at that moment were occupying those illuminated spaces and trying, like him, to remember. Remember something important, remember something banal, but always to remember. That's what we all devote ourselves to, all the time. That's where our meager energies go. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, he thought again, and again he wondered where those words came from. That's what this was about, looking back and bringing the past toward us. Please remember, Samantha Leal had said to him, Bit by bit, memory by memory, Mayarino was remembering. Back then he had just moved to the house in the mountains. The move had been more than a mere change of location, a kind of last resort, a desperate attempt to preserve by way of the strategy of separation and distance the well-being of his family. When had this moment begun brewing? With the anonymous threat, perhaps, with the violent imbalance that had followed it? For the first time, Magdalena had asked him the question that he silently asked himself every day. Was it worth it? Were the fear and the risk and the antagonism and the threats worth it? I'm not sure, said Magdalena. I'm not sure it's worth it. You'll know, but think of our daughter and think of me. I'm not sure if it's worth it. Mayarino took her words as a betrayal, a tiny betrayal, but a betrayal in any event. Had the slow and imperceptible deterioration of their relationship, that two-humped monster called a couple that for more than a decade had behaved so well, started then? But it was impossible to say, thought Mayarino, impossible to spread the years of a marriage across a table like a map and draw a chalk circle around the precise moment as the poet Silva had asked his doctor to draw a circle on the exact location of his heart. Of course, Silva, after visiting the doctor, arrived home, took off his shirt and shot himself in the exact center of the circle. That's why he'd sought the anatomy lesson, to commit an efficient suicide. Mayarino would have wanted something else, to repair, to eliminate from the chain of life the harmful moment, the first comment that was no longer impatient but hostile, the first reply bathed in sarcasm, the first glance empty of all admiration. Yes, that was it. The admiration had fallen from Magdalena's eyes. He realized that his wife's admiration had always nourished him, and finding himself suddenly without it, felt too much like a public slap in the face. The revelation struck him at once as fascinating and cruel. The experience of the need, the loss of the perfect independence Mayarino had cultivated all his life, and balanced him more than he would have expected. I won't get into bed with anybody, he used to say. It was one of his catchphrases, a behavioral guide, and Mayarino had turned to it several times to justify himself. When his cartoon was an attack on some friend of the family or an associate of his father's, ruining a business, raising doubts about his father, presenting him to the world as a man incapable of earning the loyalty of his son, Mayarino received the more or less angry complaints with strained indifference putting his art and his commitments, those are the words he used, he felt they protected him, above mere personal observances. Merely personal? Magdalena said once. Merely personal? But these people are our friends, Javier. Well, let's change friends, he replied. And family? Should we change families too? If it comes to that, 
said Maiarino. My credibility is at stake. My reputation is at stake, he thought without saying. And the sacrifices had worked. His reputation was there. His good reputation and his prestige. Maiarino had earned them the hard way. He didn't get into bed with anybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I'm regretting having left my glass of wine back there in the green room. Um, so this is the idea behind the novel. It's, it was born, uh, it was born much in the opposite way my, my other books have been born, which, has, which have been those books, a sort of exploration of how the public impinges on the, hey, <laughs> thank you, thank you, cheers. Mm. So my other books, particularly I would think The Informers on the Sound of Things Falling, have been obsessed with the way the public affects the private. Um, the public life, particularly the, the public life in Colombia, in my country, shape and uh, invade the private lives of citizens. Whereas in this novel, I realized I was starting to do the opposite. I was starting to explore the way the private, with its traumas, its shortcomings, its fears, its little private fears, shapes our public life or the impact we have on a certain kind of public life. This is what happens with, to Javier Mayarino. Um, the whole novel turns around a cartoon he Uh, he made that changed a politician's life for the worse. Um, but that cartoon was, and this is something not many critics have uh, discovered, um, that cartoon was also the result of Mayarino's own private fears and shortcomings and um, uh, traumas his relationship with his wife, his relationship with his daughter, in a way shaped his impulse to draw this cartoon that changed somebody else's life. So this novel that started being an exploration of the, um, the fragility, the vulnerability of uh, our public image, our public reputation, started in the middle to turn somewhere else, to uh, be more preoccupied with the fragility of our private memories. Because this is what he tries to do. He tries to remember what happened 20 years before in relationship to this, uh, to this cartoon he drew. Um, it's a novel, as all novels that I like, it's a novel that tries to do many things at once, tries to discuss more than one thing, tries to Um, allow for several ways of reading, for several readings. Um, when I was young, I used to admire those books that were difficult to read, but maybe easy to understand, like Joyce's Ulysses. And <clears throat> as I grow less young, um, I realize my admiration goes to the opposite kind of books those books that are very easy to read but difficult to understand in the sense that they're difficult to get to the bottom of. I hope this is that kind of book. I hope this allows for many interpretations, many readings from many different points of view um, and I hope you will appreciate it. Thank you very much. So my editor says, I'm here for you now, <laughs> for your questions or comments, or loud protests. Yes. Um, Thank you. I'm curious about taking that question of, oh God, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I have one. You have to have one, too. <laughs> oh. Uh, 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the question of readings and how your work has been received in the different places that it's been published. Yes. And related to that, whether you think that the peace process that's going on right now will change the way that your work is read within with in Colombia. <clears throat> yeah, I ask myself that very same question. Yes. Um, I think the peace process uh, in Colombia will change everything. And I think particularly it will change the stories we tell. One of the things, I don't know if any, everybody knows what is going on, but um, for the last four years the Colombian government has been negotiating a peace treaty with the Marxist FARC guerrilla. The, um, the objective of this treaty, which, ha which has just been signed finally, it's a great moment for my country, is to end a war that has been going on for 50 years. Um, now, this is what is interesting and what I have said time and time again during the last couple of months. Um, I, think, I think one of the things we have been doing in, in Havana, where negotiations took place, was also negotiating a version of these 50 years, a narrative that's able to include the experience of these 50 years of this half a century for all of us, which is incredibly difficult. These last 50 years are a story if the storyteller is a victim of the FARC guerrillas, it is a very different story if the storyteller is a victim of the paramilitaries, of the right-wing paramilitaries, and if it's a victim of uh, drug trafficking, drug violence, um, and if it's a victim, um, or if it's just, of, or if the storyteller is just somebody who's uh, a city dweller instead of a peasant. All of these are different versions of the same 50 years. And this is, what I think, one of the challenges that we're facing now as storytellers, as novelists and journalists, is to try to come up with a version of this half century that includes all of us, that allows us, all of us, to live within the same narrative. Um, I have dealt obsessively with Colombian violence in my novels, but not with this conflict, um, with other violences, uh, uh, spring from other sources. Uh, we have not been cheap with this in Colombia. Um, but my very last novel, the one that I published in Spanish after this one, deals with uh, the ability that war in Colombia, which is essentially between the, the, uh, the right and the left, basically, conservatives and liberals, uh, just with different uh, incarnations reincarnations, um, how that has uh, created a situation where people can be killed, where uh, political leaders can be killed with absolute impunity. We have, so, we have had a couple of moments in the 20th century, maybe more, three or four, that would be to use this analogy as l like a sort of JFK uh, murder in terms of a conspiracy um, and in terms of our knowledge that the full truth has not been told to us. So, so this is my last novel, and I suspect, I strongly suspect that I would go, I, I will go back to, to that side of Colombian violence, to this war that has just ended, to try to create this narrative uh, in which we can identify at, uh, at least a little bit of the truth. Uh, a partial truth, you know, or rather accept that there are coexisting truths in this, in these last 50 years, and it's 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 up to us to to tell them, to narrate them. Uh, in all of that, there there should be an answer to your question. But there is. And, and also there is. The good. Guardian op-ed was, was beautiful on this subject, and if anyone hasn't read it, I would recommend it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you said that Reputations in Spanish came out in 2013. Yeah. So three years later, the English version comes out. Do you try to just translate it 
as directly as possible while maintaining it, or are you tempted at all to make further revisions and treat it like a newer draft? Oh, I always make further revisions, yeah. Um, there's a great Mexican essayist called Alfonso Reyes. He said, we publish so that we don't spend the whole life r revising drafts. <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, in, in, in the languages that I can have a say in, uh, English and French, I always change things, yes. Um, and I work very closely with translators. Uh, they have become friends of mine, so they, they, they actively ask me to change things when the Spanish version sounds much better than the literal translation, and they really can't find another way to go uh, other than change things. So if you read my books in, in the two languages, you will find that maybe a character that wears uh, um, pants in Spanish is wearing a skirt in English, because it sounds better in that sentence. Um, so yeah, we do change things, we do try to uh, to make things sound better. Uh, this is this is my criteria, the uh, the uh, euphonics uh, of it. Yeah. Thank you. But of course, that's the hard part about being a translator myself. I, I earned a living as a translator for maybe five years, um, a long time ago, and I, I, you know I know how that how that works from the inside. So I'm terrible for my translators. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if there are any books that you read either during the process of writing this that you were influenced by the voice that came out of those authors or if there were any that you read in the past that may have somehow influenced the writing of this novel. There are a lot of books that I can name that were an influence. I think influences in in the end, when novelists think of, of influence, um, they're really talking about the books that allowed them, that gave them permission to do things that either they didn't know how to do or they didn't know they were allowed to do. Um, a couple of things were important in this book, and this is, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to, to say this. This is a book about a single night and about what happened in that single night 28 years uh, before the action starts. But more than that, it's a book about the unreliability of memory, about how impossible it is for us to really know what happened in the past. There are several implications of this, um, but the, the center of the book is how difficult it is to know the past, to know what really what we really saw, what we really heard, and this is the predicament he's in, Mayarino, and the girl, Samantha Lea. So um, that meant I was going to build a whole book around a dark place where we don't know what is going on. Um, a friend of mine, Javier Cercas, a great Spanish novelist, calls this the blind spot. Is, is this the name? Or when you look in the mirror and... Yeah. The blind spot of novels. That place in a novel where we don't know what, what is going on, but, but that fact, the fact that we don't know, is the novel. That unanswered question is the whole book. So if you have read uh, Kafka's The Process, you know that we never learn why Joseph K. was arrested. If Kafka had told us, the book would be of no value at all. <laughs> all the interest of this book comes from the fact that we don't know. We don't know why he was arrested. Um, more or less the same thing happens with this. So, the master of this kind of ambiguity, the master of um, um, building a narrative around a silence is Henry James. So I, I studied and, and I read and studied closely several books by Henry James, and I think in a way their lessons are here. Um, in terms of, of um, a certain look at life, a, a certain way of you know, building 
paragraphs that can capture some sort of life. Uh, there, there is a Latin American writer called Juan Carlos Onetti from Uruguay. He's an extraordinary novelist, and he's much, very much present in this book. Um, and of course, there's the, 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 the uh, tragic factor of the book. The, this book is a tragedy. It was conceived as a tragedy, as the, the study of one man's doom, as I was telling before, um, in a very short time span. The, the, the whole action of the book t t takes less than 72 hours. And um, it's not one revolution of the sun, as the Greeks wanted tragedy to be, but it's almost that. So, so tragedy as a way of dealing with uh, human life and human shortcomings and human uh, hubris, which is essentially the subject of the book, one of the subjects of the book, was very much a, an influence. So yeah, many books I could go on, you know, discussing influences. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the reading earlier. That was great. And my question um, has to do with going to your main character. And earlier you made a comment about him being a political cartoonist that served as kind of a moral conscience in Colombia. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's anything you've ever seen in American culture that maybe a position or a figure that really comes anywhere even close to what that seems to serve in your book. If there's any comparison you could draw, perhaps. Yeah. Um, well, there are... Cartoons still do something in America. Remember that, that scandal um, some months ago when the New Yorker featured in its cover a cartoon of Obama and Michelle Obama um, in a sort of Islamic costume, in a way it was, I think. Um, there was great outrage about that. So yeah, cartoons still say things. Um, the thing is, for whatever reasons, that I haven't really uh, gone to the bottom of. Um, it's not the same thing that happens in Colombia. I think it's probably the French tradition. Colombia comes culturally, at least in the, in the 19th century, from French culture. And the, the power cartoonists, uh, satirical uh, artists such as Daumier in France who were able to, um, to you know, draw a cartoon of the king without anything happening to them, because they were so feared and so respected. This is where we have uh, grown up as, as a nation, as a journalism in a nation. Um, they were great cartoonists in England in the 18th century, and I think some sort of heritage came to America of that, but it has disappeared. I don't think it's there anymore. I think they're very uh, well-respected cartoonists, and maybe some cartoons are able to create uh, a little bit of uh, debate. Um, but in my country, they actually worry politicians, and politicians actually work actively to try to control what the most influential cartoonists are saying. One of the people I talked to, a friend of mine, Vlado, he signs his cartoons as Vlado, told me about the time he got this call from a very powerful Colombian uh, general, a military man, um, who asked the cartoonist to see him. So. It's not the cartoonist asking a powerful general to receive him, it's the other way around. And this guy said to, um, said to my friend, the cartoonist, look, you used to draw me with all my crooked teeth, with dark glasses the size of Pinochet's. I have changed my glasses, I have had a dental treatment, and you still draw me the same way. Please, change the drawings. My wife is worried. My daughter makes fun of me. Change that. The answer, the answer my, my friend gave was, General, that money was down the drain. That money went down the drain. It's, um, this is how you will go down in Colombian history, with your old teeth and your old glasses. The thing is, yeah, don't pity him. It's, uh, <laughs> 
Um, what I'm trying to say is that when a powerful military man asks a cartoonist to stop drawing him that way, it's because uh, drawings matter. These things, these people still are, a, are powerful political commentators. And it's wonderful that, that they have that, that power, if they are good, if they're good people, decent people, which my friend is. Yeah. Um, as a translator and novelist, going back to the question of translation, I was wondering kind of what are the characteristics you find among the three languages you speak that don't often translate in ways that you want them to? What are sort of the biggest frustrations of going from English to Spanish or Spanish to English, either the euphonics or the semantics and kind of what are your, what is your sense of the qualities of those languages? Yeah, yeah. No, it's mostly the rhythm of the sentences. Yeah. Languages have a, a natural way of breathing, um, which reflects in the metrics we use to poetry, to write poetry. So uh, the way the English language works, um, it, it, the, the breathing of the English language is the reason why classical poetry, Shakespeare for instance, is written in iambic pentameters. Um, in Spanish, the, the, the music is very different. Sentences are longer. Um, we rarely end a verse in poetry with the accent in the last syllable, for instance. It's a silly thing, but it's not so silly. It's, it, it speaks of a certain way of, of a certain rhythm sentences have. Um, the way we write poetry, the, 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 the classic metrics of our poetry, are eight syllables and eleven syllables. Um, so in the same way that to translate classical Spanish poetry, eleven syllables for instance, into English, you would have to find a way to make it ten syllables, the iambic pentameter. The same thing happens in, in prose, if you care about these things. Obviously if, you've, if you're writing uh, genre fiction and this is not one of your biggest concerns then no problem but if you care for the for the the sound and the rhythm and 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 the uh, um, uh, the music of prose then these things matter and um, and this is one of the most difficult things to to make happen this is why I'm so glad that my, my translator, Anne McLean, found a perfect iambic pentameter to end the novel. It's, uh, it goes... This is not a spoiler, don't worry. It goes, and then he'll do the same with all the rest. Perfect. Hi, huh, Jim? <laughs> We've got one of the best Shakespearean scholars in the world here, so he knows what I'm talking about. And then he'll do the same with all the rest. Perfect iambic pentameter. Kudos to Anne McLean. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Tell us one novel by someone you love that's easy to read and hard to understand. Um, hmm. Javier Cercas is um, soldiers of Salamis. Salamis is what you is this the title in English? Soldiers of Salamis, a novel by uh, Spanish novelist Javier Cercas. It's one of those. Um, the best novels <coughs> of Milan Kundera are very easy to read, but hard to get to the bottom of. Um, Chronicle of a Death Foretold by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, for instance. Um, there are so many, uh, I don't know, Heart of Darkness. It's not that easy to read. Uh, yeah, it, it is, it is. But it's, it's so hard to, it, it has so many levels. Um, the Stranger by Albert Camus. 60 years of, of criticism trying to explain this book. Nobody has ever been able to get to the bottom of it. Um, Don Quixote. Anyway, I could go on and on. Thank you. Thank you very much.